Moving on to number 10 with Talon from Earth 3. Now unless you guys don't know, Earth 3 is the home to an evil Justice League known as the Crime Syndicate of America. On this world, Batman is actually Owlman and he is also Thomas Wayne Jr, not Bruce Wayne. Now he takes on Dick Grayson just like his regular Earth counterpart, only this Richard Grayson takes on the much more sinister name of Talon. But Talon began a relationship with Duella Dent who happened to be the daughter of the heroic jokester on Earth 3. Yes, that is a good guy version of the Joker. He and Duella came to New Earth and joined the Teen Titans during the year after the Infinite Crisis and together they actually stood against Black Adam during World War 3. Number 9, the third Batman on New 52 Earth 2. The Earth 2 introduced in the New 52 is different from the original Earth 2 where the Golden Age characters reside. Instead, this Earth 2 sees Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman pass away in the first in invasion of Earth by Steppenwolf and the forces of Apocalypse, who took over the world. Dick in this reality was married to Barbara Gordon and they even shared a child together before she also passed away. Dick Grayson ended up training with Ted Grant and became this future's third Batman after Thomas Wayne took the mantle alongside his son who acted as his Robin. He was a much more aggressive and darker version of Dick Grayson, which really worked well when he became the Dark Knight. Hey y'all! If you enjoyed this video so far, be sure to whack that like button it's all you gotta do to let us know we are doing a good job. Thanks so much, nerds. On to number eight, Injustice. Dick Grayson in the Injustice universe was a superhero and sidekick to Batman, just like the original. But Grayson still acted as Batman's original Robin, still led the Titans, and still struck out on his own as Nightwing. He was succeeded by Jason Todd, Tim Drake, and eventually Damian Wayne as Robin. But he formed a bond with Damian, and he is even seen as Damian's mentor. However, after Damian sides with Superman, in Injustice, he accidentally causes the death of Nightwing when he throws his weapon at his head, causing Nightwing to stumble, fall, and land on a rock that breaks his neck. It's honestly quite the shocking turn of events. Now eventually, Dick became the successor to Boston Brand as the second dead man, giving him the ability to fight again from beyond the grave with the powers of flight, intangibility, invisibility, and possession. Number 7, DCEU Cyborg. Played excellently by Ray Fisher, the movie version of Cyborg seen in Justice League initially refused to join the team, though after his father was captured, he voluntarily pitches in and he successfully saves his father from the hands of Steppenwolf. When Superman returned, his offensive system kicked in and he attacked Superman, which triggered the Man of Steel to fight the Justice League, which was a really cool moment. Cyborg also played a super important role in the final act, where he began to separate the mother boxes that had formed the Unity. And of course, with the help of Superman, he succeeded, since no one in this universe can do anything without Henry Cavill, apparently. Thankfully, Cyborg has a substantially larger role in Zack Snyder's massive Justice League director's cut, which delves deeper into his backstory and his strained relationship with his father. I kind of hope we get to see Ray Fisher reprise the role at some point. Number 6, Flashpoint Cyborg. When Barry Allen Flash goes back in time to try and save his mom, he royally messes up the timeline, pretty much changing the whole DC universe. In this newly created timeline called Flashpoint, Cyborg is America's greatest hero in place of Superman, based out of Detroit. When the Amazons and the Atlanteans go to war with each other, Cyborg tries to gather a group of Earth's superhumans to help stop the conflict that has already ravaged half of Europe. But thanks to Thomas Wayne, this timeline's Batman refusing to join up, nobody else wanted to join his group either. But then, superstar Barry Allen shows up and convinces Wayne otherwise, and the three set off to gather together an army and save the day. Number 5, Superwoman. While Superwoman is technically an alternate version of Wonder Woman, originally she was actually the Lois Lane from Earth 3, who on this world was seemingly an Amazon as she wielded the lasso of submission instead of truth, which is capable of forcing others to do her bidding and forcing them to love her. But this Superwoman had abilities that were more like a Kryptonian. She was capable of not only everything Wonder Woman could do, but she could fire beams of red hot energy from her eyes and she could fly. She created an incredibly toxic love triangle between Ultraman and Owlman of the Crime Syndicate of America and even had a child with Owlman but promised to Ultraman that it was his. This was also while she was having another affair with Alexander Luther. Damn girl, keeping pretty busy, huh? Mm. 
Yikes. Number four, Raven from the last 52 multiverse. The Batman who laughs comes from the dark multiverse, which is the flip side of the regular multiverse, composed of worlds where nightmares become real. All the worst case scenarios actually came to be on these worlds. During the final battle between the Batman who laughs and Wonder Woman, laughs summons different heroes turned villains from across the dark multiverse to help him, and among the various characters is a version of the Teen Titans led by a version of Raven who gave in to her father. Trigon, who corrupted both her and her titans into twisted, powerful versions of themselves. Raven herself becomes a red-skinned, armor-clad demon. She actually looks kind of awesome, but she is undeniably evil and ultimately quite terrifying. Number three, Furnace. Before the Martians became the Martians, they were an incredibly violent and powerful race called the Burning. The Guardians of the Universe experimented on the Burning and put genetic blocks in place to make them afraid of the fire they used as their most powerful weapon. Now fast forward, after the Justice League was trapped and taken down in Obsidian Age Atlantis, John Johns blamed himself for his friend's passing because his fear of fire completely overtook him. He recruits Scorch to help him overcome this fear, and he would use his telepathy to help her deal with her own problems. Unfortunately, in doing this, he also broke the genetic blocks, allowing John to become the incredibly dangerous Furnace, with all his original powers boosted in potential, especially his telepathy, plus an insane level of pyrokinesis. Number two, Ultraman. In case you haven't figured out the theme of Earth 3, everyone here is just bad from birth. Ultraman was born on the dying crypt to Jor-Il, who was able to secure a life pod for his incredibly powerful son, who he saw as his best chance of revenge. While in his life pod, Kal-Il was given the ideology of becoming the strongest possible being, eschewing all weakness in himself and in others. His rocket crash landed in Smallville, right through the home of the dysfunctional couple, Johnny and Martha Kent, who he forced to be his parents until he was seven years old, when he took their lives and burned their home to the ground. He took the name Ultraman, took over the Earth, and created the Crime Syndicate of America. Now, unlike Superman, Ultraman actually gets more powerful from Kryptonite, and the sun is what makes him weaker, which is fine, because he will literally just move the moon to block out the sun. And in at number one is Vampire Batman. In the Elseworlds Batman and Dracula trilogy, Batman goes up against vampires who have turned Gotham into their home, and then eventually, Dracula himself. In the first novel, Red Rain, the hero wipes out the vampires and Dracula, although he is transformed into a vampire himself. Which means we get to see Batman take on crime using the powers of a vampire in the next novel, Bloodstorm. He does his bestest to resist the darker aspects of being a vampire, but that all goes kaput when Batman lashes out and drains the Joker's blood after the Joker de-lifed Catwoman. Batman has Alfred and Gordon stake him, putting Batman into a catatonic state. A state that he is revived from in Crimson Mist, the third novel when criminals took over Gotham in his absence. But he is almost completely animalistic now thanks to the isolation. A bloodthirsty vampire Batman quickly wipes out most of his enemies in a very bloody form, drinking their blood in the process until he is finally put to rest by Alfred, Gordon, Two-Face, and Killer Croc, who all go with him to the grave. Number 10. Yeoman America. Back in Avengers Volume 3, number 2, in January of 1998, Morgan Le Fay's reality distortion wave caused the time period to be altered to a medieval setting, which altered the Avengers' clothing, speech patterns, and thought processes. For Stephen Rogers, he became Yeoman America, a knight like soldier with red, blue, and white stars and stripes armor, and weapons including a sword and a more fantasy like shield. Now, to be clear, this is just regular 616 Captain America, but magically timed. Time displaced, so he's got all of his same abilities, but something about wearing a suit of armor and wielding a sword like that makes him just kind of better than himself, in my opinion. I don't know. Number nine. Hydra Cap. While this version of Captain America did appear largely in the 616 reality, he's actually technically from an alternate timeline created by a Hydra brainwashed cubic who used her reality warping powers to make Captain America his ideal self. But since she was being influenced by Hydra, his ideal self was a Captain America who grew up being made loyal to Hydra. This Cap would eventually supplant the real Captain America of 616 and would organize the second superhuman civil war 
as well as Shatauri invasions on the Earth. He got promoted to director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and influenced the legalization of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Act, which gave S.H.I.E.L.D. way more authority. He used this new power to basically organize a Hydra takeover of America, with Steve becoming the Hydra Supreme and bringing on the Secret Empire event. He was defeated by the proper version of Captain America, brought back by Cubic, but this Steve manipulated his way into an extremely high position of power, banishing mutants, imprisoning inhumans, creating a Hydra Avengers team, and forcing other heroes into the underground. Number 8. Peggy Carter. If you've seen the Marvel Studios What If show, you know alternate versions of Peggy Carter get the Super Soldier Serum in place of Steven Rogers. Fans love this idea, even if it's strange for a British agent to become Captain America. There are a few different versions of Captain Carter to choose from, but they all generally share the same abilities. There was a version of the character who appeared in Exiles number 3 in 2018 who had a great costume. The one in the Disney Plus show joined the Guardians of the Multiverse, so she was clearly an exceptional version of the character. She's also shown up in a new Marvel Cinematic Universe movie sporting a jetpack, and was able to give the villain of that movie a real good run for their money while other more powerful characters were like felled instantly. She can be a bit more hot headed than her Steve Rogers counterpart, sure, but she has the power of fan love. And if you know anything about what that power can do, you know that Peggy Carter as Captain America is very powerful. Number 7 Spider UK. Ah. The first Spider-Man mashed with another Marvel hero. These mashups always make for powerful characters. Basically, Spider-UK is William Braddock, hailing from Earth 833. If you haven't gathered from the Braddock namesake, Spider-UK is what would happen if Spider-Man was Captain Britain. As such, he is part of the Captain Britain Corps, being introduced in the Edge of Spider-Verse Volume 1. He is also part of the Spider Army, put together to take on the Inheritors. And a pretty important part of it, he was not only an amazing leader, but also had a very useful dimension hopping ability. Unfortunately, this Spider-Man didn't actually have a spider sense, which is probably what allowed him to be de-lifed by an attack from behind in Spider-Geddon number one. Number six, Spider-Man 2099. Probably one of the most loved characters on this list. The Spider-Man of Earth 928, Miguel O'Hara, or as he's better known, Spider-Man of the dystopian future of 2099. This version of Spider-Man has many similar abilities to 616 Peter Parker, but some that are not so similar. He has super speed, which is actually capable of somehow creating a decoy. His spider sense allows him to telepathically communicate with others. He has accelerated vision, he has retractable talons, and also has fangs that he can use to paralyze others. And he has the famously disgusting organic spider silk spinnerets on his wrists. He first appeared as a preview in Amazing Spider-Man number 365 in June of 1992, and in his own series in Spider-Man 2099 number one in September 1992, and he is a titanically awesome Awesome character. At number five is Beta Ray Bill. This guy is a very aggressive but also very respectable Thor variant. He sort of just butts into Thor's life and takes his title without even so much as a conversation first. It's sort of funny actually. They start as rivals and quickly become friends when they realize they pretty much match each other's power levels almost identically. Basically, Beta Ray Bill is a champion from his own world of Corbin, and when it's tragically destroyed by Searcher, he is forced to go on a pilgrimage to find a new home with a group of his own kind. And guess where they end up? They end up in the Milky Way. But as he's entering Thor's airspace, Thor decides it's kind of his duty to go and check in on the caravan with no intention to do any harm, just to check. But Thor's motivations are totally misunderstood by Beta Ray Bill, and he decides to launch a counterattack, thinking Thor is approaching aggressively. They both fight, and the battle ends with actually a victory for Beta Ray Bill, who then promptly picks up Thor's hammer without issue. This comes as an absolute shock to Thor and everyone else because this has otherwise been an extremely uncommon occurrence up to this point. Thankfully for Thor, Odin rules that instead of offering Mjolnir to Beta Ray Bill, he would instead craft a whole new weapon for the Corbinite called Stormbreaker. After all this is settled, Beta Ray Bill actually ends up becoming a friend of Thor's and even steps in for the God of Thunder when he's out of town or out of commission. At number four, we have Old King Thor. This version of the God of Thunder is basically an older, futuristic version of the 616 counterpart we're used to. Hailing from Earth 14412, this version of Thor. 
Thor is the all father and ruler of Asgard as we currently know Odin to be. His look is pretty intimidating having a more advanced and seemingly fortified armor as well as only one eye. The eye is missing because similarly to his father Odin he too gave his eye in exchange for all the knowledge in the nine realms. On top of all that old King Thor seems to have refined and perfected all of his abilities meaning that it could be pretty easily argued that this version of Thor is in fact better than the original. In terms of power levels at least. And I think it's also always helpful for a hero to have more wisdom as well which we can all safely say old King Thor has in droves. I mean just look at him. Although to be fair to Thor 616 it's sort of known that old King Thor is just an older version of 616 Thor even though he's from Earth 14412. Now I'm not sure if Thor developed some ability to travel to other realities but old King Thor has suggested a few times before that if 616 Thor were to die he would too. So there may not be any comparison since they're kind of the same dude. Just one is a lot older and arguably more badass looking. At number three is Jane Foster. This version of Thor has one of the most intriguing backstories on the list. Jane Foster is just an average mortal from Earth 616 who basically discovers that she's capable of lifting Mjolnir. The way this happens is that Jane gets a job as a nurse and befriends Thor who is in his human form resembling a rather frail doctor named Donald Blake. But eventually he reveals his true identity to Jane as well as confessing his love for her. She then becomes the first mortal that has ever been brought to Asgard but when she's endowed with Asgardian powers she becomes overwhelmed by the responsibilities and so Odin deems her not ready for the task sending her back to earth and wiping her memory. But once again years down the line she reunites with Donald Blake aka Thor and they fall in love once again but only after a pretty rocky reunion. She's then tragically diagnosed with cancer, the illness that killed her mother when she was only nine years old. And fast forwarding a bit, Thor is battling on Earth's moon when he realizes that he has lost his ability to wield Mjolnir. And when the hammer begins to call to Jane, she soon learns that she is meant to become the new Thor. The hammer seeks her out telepathically and she travels to find it on the moon. When she successfully lifts it, she transforms into a powerful goddess. Well, she transforms into Thor and her health immediately increases as well as her physical appearance. She then goes on to be a really powerful and impressive version of Thor and even sacrifices herself at one point for Asgard but is revived by Odin for her heroism. This is just such a cool and satisfying story of a Thor finding her way, starting as a mortal and becoming one of the most powerful gods in the cosmos and despite all the bad hands dealt to her by life too. At number two we've got Thor L which you can maybe guess is basically a combination of Superman and Thor. One interesting thing about this guy off the bat is that he's blue. This is because when the two characters merge Superman is in his blue energy form and this merge that I mentioned is referring to the ultimate access crossover from the 90s. During this series Marvel and DC lay down their feud to give fans a really interesting look into a world where Marvel and DC characters have both merged and what a great combination to see merged into one Superman and Thor. This is almost an unfair marriage of abilities which makes probably one of the most powerful Thors on this list actually arguably the most powerful that is if the number one spot on the list wasn't a thing. I know his accolades might not be the most extensive given the extremely short run of the character. In fact he only really exists for about half an issue but I really don't think the character should be written off due to his brevity. This list is about the value of a character in relation to the original Thor we're used to and just adding Superman to an already powerful and extremely impressive hero there's no question that this one has a leg up on Thor 616. At number one we've got old Phoenix King Thor or King Phoenix God of Fire. And if you're already pretty sure what this variant is all about you're probably right because the name is pretty self explanatory. He's old King Thor having been overtaken by the Phoenix Force. In 2018's Thor Volume 5 Issue 6 Thor is facing off against Doctor Doom in a distant future when he also encounters a Phoenix possessed Wolverine who is basically a walking flaming adamantium skeleton at that point. And only when Wolverine reaches to grab Thor's hammer does he basically explode and disappear and pass on the Phoenix Force to Mjolnir which just leaves old King Thor and Doctor Doom to face off. But 
This isn't any ordinary Doctor Doom. It's a Doctor Doom endowed with the powers of the Iron Fist, Starbrand, Doctor Strange, and Ghost Rider all in one. And with the prosperity of Earth on the line, Old King Thor knows that he has to act fast not to end up overpowered by his supercharged Doctor Doom variant. So he makes the bold move of grabbing the hammer and allowing himself to be overtaken by Phoenix Force. With Old King Thor being one of the most powerful versions on the list, this variant instantly becomes hands down the most powerful we've ever seen. At number 10, we have Johnny Quick of Earth 3. In this dimension, the Justice League exists as a legion of criminals called the Crime Syndicate, made up of evil versions of the heroes we're used to seeing in the Justice League. Flash's evil counterpart, Johnny Quick, has powers similar to Barry Allen and is credited with defeating the first iteration of the Doom Patrol alongside his girlfriend and partner in crime, Atomica. He also traps the Justice League of Prime Earth in the Firestorm Matrix, which is a pretty impressive demonstration of power on its own. And it may suggest that he is more in tune with his abilities than Prime Earth's Flash, giving him a spot on this list without question. However, he is soon defeated by Captain Cold, who freezes one of his legs and shatters it before breaking his neck. And simply because Johnny Quick loses as badly and as quickly as he wins, he's held back a bit on this list. At number nine, we have Avery Ho from Prime Earth. Avery gains her powers in the Flash Volume 5 when the Speed Force goes out of whack and endows masses of regular people with super speed. Avery is a relatively new hero who has only been around since 2016, but we can be pretty confident that she'll only continue to grow in power and ability as time goes on. Partly through experience with the Speed Force and working alongside Wally West, but mainly because of a distinct ability she has that's unique to this variant in particular, in that she can siphon speed from other people, allowing her to increase her speed on command. So it's not hard to see how even if she's not at her height of power yet, she might soon reach a power level that might surpass even the most powerful variants on this list. At number 8 is Danica Williams from Earth 12. Also known as Beyond Flash, this version of the Flash exists in the 2040s alongside Terry McGinnis aka Batman Beyond. Danica is known to be one of the most powerful versions of the Flash, having the ability to communicate with past iterations of the Flash like Jay Garrick and Wally West. This helps her develop as a hero and gain enough foresight that she can avoid making some of the tougher mistakes that she would have made had she been all on her own. It also proves to be the case that variants from the future usually have some kind of advantage to their present day counterparts due to experience and futuristic technology. Personally, I just think there's something special about Earth 12 because Batman Beyond is also a really powerful Batman variant and he comes from Earth 12 as well. And Danica Williams rubs shoulders with him quite often matching his power and intellect most of the time. At number 7 we have Bart Allen aka Kid Flash, FKA Impulse. Hailing from New Earth, this teenage speedster is credited with being able to go faster than the speed of light. And those who understand the laws of physics would know how much of a game changer this is for Bart. It effectively gives him the power to transcend the laws of relativity. His abilities are so impressive partly due to the fact that Bart originally exists in the 30th century before coming back to the present. And being as young as he is is he hasn't yet shown the full potential of his impressive speed. But once he matures into adulthood, we may end up witnessing the most powerful speedster that the world has ever seen. The only thing that sets him back on this list was his struggle with an illness that caused him to age pretty rapidly. He is able to get it under control, but he ages about 10 years in the time it would take anyone else to age too. So we hope this doesn't hinder him any further because he's one of the most powerful flashes out there and has tons of potential. At number 6, we have Reverse Flash. First appearing in the Flash 139 as far back as 1963, Eobard Thawne is an evil opposite to the Flash that gets his powers from the Negative Speed Force. But don't let the name confuse you, the Negative Speed Force doesn't negate anything. This inverted variant of the Flash can reach insane speeds and can even move through objects and walls, cause whirlwinds using his body, and most impressively of all, he can travel between dimensions at will. Not only this, but he has electrokinesis, which allows him to charge up electrical energy from his movement and fire blasts of negative speed force lightning at his victims. He can even use this power to steal years of life from his targets and age them to death. And if someone gets the better of him, Reverse Flash even has a healing factor that allows him to mend wounds and even regrow limbs. Number 5. 
Robot Man. This version of our favorite cybernetic hero comes from the Kingdom Come universe. In this storyline, Victor Stone actually becomes fully integrated with his robotics, losing his physical humanity in the process. But thanks to this being the future, technology is a little bit more advanced and he becomes made up of a liquid metal, all Terminator T-1000 style. Since he can shape his form in any way he wants, he chooses to look as human as possible, at least in shape. He's still all super shiny liquid metal, so it doesn't really work out fully. But Victor then joined the Superman's Justice League to combat the rogue metahumans taking the name Robot Man. Unfortunately though, he met his end in the Gulag with a large group of other heroes. Number 4, Cyborg 2.0. Okay, so this one involves time travel, which I hate, but alas, here we are. So basically, the Teen Titans end up traveling to the 31st century to help out the Legion of Super superheroes. And on their way back, they end up 10 years in their future, and they encounter an alternate timeline version of themselves who have become a fascist crime fighting force. The Titans came back and vowed to never become that future, so they split up to avoid it. Only, that is the exact thing that caused this future to occur in the first place. Victor was one of the first to turn to the dark side, and he created the Titans East, and also caused the phantom limbs to appear. He also had this really cool slimmed down look. It was kind of awesome, but he was evil, so you, you can't really take a side. Sorry. Number three, Superman. Some of you may not know, but the original Nightwing was actually a hero of Krypton. It's where the name originated, and Superman telling this story to a young Dick Grayson is what inspired him to take on the name Nightwing. But did you know Superman himself took the name? And even before Dick Grayson did it, Yes, Superman Kal-El has been Nightwing twice in fact. In pre-crisis, he was the first ever to be called Nightwing in 1963. Now, at this time he actually had no powers and he took on the name while Jimmy Olsen took on the counterpart to this, the first Flamebird. The second time, Superman donned the Nightwing identity on a reformed Krypton in the post-crisis world alongside Lois Lane as Flamebird. These two heroes were both Kryptonian legends and Superman wasn't the only Krypton native to take on the role over the years either. Number two, Joker. On Earth 31, this version of Dick Grayson never actually became Nightwing. In fact, working under the much more strict, mean, and militaristic Bruce Wayne, Dick was even fired from being Robin for incompetence, presumably caused by not getting past the death of his parents. Years later, and this version of Grayson goes a little insane. He goes through an experimental procedure that makes him essentially immortal through cellular regeneration powers, with the side effect of him being driven absolutely bonkers. With his abilities, he couldn't be killed by almost anything. He was attacked with acid, thermite, and C4, and even had his head taken off with no success. He became the second Joker after the original one and took out several retired superheroes, including the Creeper and the Guardian. After attempting to do the same to Catgirl, Batman finally took him down by throwing him into lava and extinguishing all of his cells simultaneously at once. May not be the most beloved Frank Miller story, but it's certainly um, an interesting version of Joker. And in at number one, finally, is Dr. Fate from Flashpoint. In Flashpoint, Dick Grayson was one third of the family acrobatics team called the Flying Graysons that toured with Halley's Circus. While touring in Poland, the circus was actually attacked by Amazon soldiers looking to steal Kent Nelson's helmet of fate, the most powerful magical artifact in the world, according to Black Alice. In their escape, Nelson was killed, but Grayson and a few survivors managed to keep the helmet in their possession. The rest of Halley's survivors were killed by the Amazons, leaving only Dick Grayson and the helmet on the run with the ghost of Dead Man to protect him. He eventually decided to use the Helmet of Fate against the Amazons by becoming Dr. Fate, which granted him godlike arcane power, increasing his sorcery. It also grants him elemental control, including pyrokinesis, hydrokinesis, geokinesis, aerokinesis, cosmic awareness, and even precognition. Number 10, Mazaz. On Earth 3, things are kind of backwards. Power and strength reign supreme, and those who are superheroes and villains in the Prime Universe are supervillains and heroes, respectively, in Earth 3. Alexander Luther, for example, was the most powerful superhero on Earth, going by the name Mazaz, which is Shazam backwards. Now, he's technically a good guy, but his power is what I find truly terrifying. 
terrifying. Mazaz has the ability to absorb the powers of any superpowered being that he took the life of through his lightning. Using this, he gained all the powers of Bizarro, including invulnerability, self sustenance, arctic vision, flame breath, and kryptonite immunity. He got the powers of the Firestorm Matrix from Deathstorm, which are too many to list, the Speed Force abilities from Johnny Quick, and the powers of Hawkwing. While the characters he fought were arguably worse than him, no one from Earth 3 is really good, and he is absolutely terrifying when he is powered up, of course. Number 9 Bump in the Night. For starters, DC's House of Horror is basically a collection of short stories featuring different characters. They are all equally interesting and horror themed. The possession of Billy Batson and Last Laugh stories are particularly interesting, but for today's video, I think I want to talk about the very first one. Bump in the Night. This short story follows Martha Kent on the night Kal El arrives on Earth. Jonathan Kent has gone out to explore what exactly caused a big bang and a trail of smoke on the Kent's farm, but he isn't coming back. As Martha worries about where her husband has gone to, she goes back inside the house, but Martha starts hearing bumping and thumping coming from upstairs in the house. Suddenly, a demonic humanoid child crashes through the ceiling and begins attacking her. She tries to run to the barn, but fiery beams of energy fire from the creature blowing up the barn. She takes refuge in her truck only for the creature to land on the hood, shrieking. It throws the truck across the yard and Martha gets out wounded only for the truck to explode. The creature flies away with the symbol of an S emblazoned on his chest. If you are looking for comic book content, this is the place to find it. So hit us with a subscribe to stay inundated with tons of videos about all your favorite heroes. Thank you. Number 8. Speed Demon from the Amalgam Universe The Amalgam Universe, where the worlds of Marvel and DC collide, is honestly an amazing place. We get all kinds of crazy mashups like Wolverine and Batman, but while that is incredibly awesome, the one I think may be better for this list would be Blaze Allen, the Speed Demon, or basically, the Flash mashed together with Ghost Rider. Yes, it's as crazy as it sounds, and honestly, it's more totally awesome than it is scary, but Ghost Rider is already fast with his motorcycle, so imagine if he didn't even need that. The best part of this is that his cousin, Wally West, becomes another version of Speed Demon, and the two of them work together. It's not something that I thought I needed, but I absolutely did need it. Number 7. Electric Superman During the 90s, to make Superman more interesting, I guess, DC decided that instead of his normal powers, they would give him Superman energy-based abilities. It instantly makes me wonder who would win in a fight between classic soups or this guy. This Superman needed to wear a containment suit that helped him regulate his new powers. He could turn back into Clark Kent at will, but at the cost of losing the ability to actually use these new powers. This version of Superman also didn't have the traditional super strength that we'd expect. Instead, he could use energy fields to lift incredibly heavy objects, which is kind of the same as the regular Superman, but mm. But wait, there's also more. He could also split his body into two so that he could perform different tasks. He could teleport manipulate energy, he had molecular control, and even more. But then, just as a little bit of icing on the cake, he's also immune to kryptonite attacks and red solar energy, which is a big boon for any alternate Superman. Number 6. Val Zod Val Zod is sort of like the third Superman of Earth 2. He was also saved from Krypton's destruction, and after the passing of Kal-El during an invasion of Darkseid, it seemed that Kal came back stronger and unimpeded by morals, now serving Darkseid under the name Brutal. Turns out though that this was actually just a clone created by Darkseid and he was eventually defeated by Val Zod. That's probably largely to do with the fact that Val here is a man who values intelligence over strength. He has a wealth of knowledge gained through years of Kryptonian study and is possibly smarter than all humans. Val Zod is stronger because he knows how to use the energy fields that are powered by the Yellow Sun. In that regard, he was powerful enough to defeat Brutal, who was said to be strong stronger than the original Superman himself. At number 5 is Savitar from the Arrowverse. In the DCEU, Savitar is a futuristic version of Barry Allen who is jaded by a failure that turns his family and friends against him. So what does one do when they're cast out of society? Right, they decide to become a god. But joking aside, he does get his speeds to a point where he easily surpasses the abilities of his prime self and even starts to notice his body ripping apart 
due to such high speeds. This is why we see him in this insane armor. He designs this armor to keep himself safe at his unimaginable speeds. He then goes back in time and across dimensions to spread awareness of his godlike status before going back to modern day prime earth and facing himself as this newly improved yet fully evil variant. At number four is Black Flash. Black Flash is a manifestation of death that is fast enough to chase down any speedster and take them out for good. He can move faster than the speed of light and is immortal, putting him very high on the list. It's unclear why Black Flash is always trying to kill speedsters like Barry Allen and Wally West, but it's suggested that these speedsters are so fast that they can outrun time and therefore death. Unless of course death were to somehow, oh I don't know, send a conduit after them that also uses the speed force, which is what the Black Flash essentially is. This variant first appears in the Flash Volume 2 issue 138 in 1998 and has been spotted in moments right before the deaths of Barry Allen and Johnny Quick. He has also chased after Wally West, but Wally was able to defeat this variant by running all the way to the end of time, destroying Black Flash because when they're there's no time, death has no meaning. But to think that these are the lengths Wally has to go to get rid of Black Flash just shows how insanely powerful this variant is. At number three is Wally West of Earth 22. Featured in the Kingdom Come storyline from the 90s, Wallace West is an amalgamation of all the former holders of the Flash mantle. Wally West, Barry Allen, and Jay Garrick. He's such a powerful version of the Flash that he is in constant motion, only appearing as a hazy blur most of the time. He then becomes an interdimensional being with a hyper awareness of the relationship between dimensions and his influence on reality. In this way, he is pretty much a god and is known to have achieved more than any any flash from any other dimension. This could be due to his age as well because Wallace West is an older iteration of the Flash, but it could also be chalked up to his near omniscience and omnipresence as a Flash variant. He isn't quite immortal like the Black Flash, but his mastery of interdimensional knowledge could be considered a more powerful trait than even immortality. In our number two spot is the Red Death. The Barry Allen from Earth 52 is a villainous combination of Batman and the Flash and is known to be the most powerful version of the Flash in the whole multiverse, but I beg to differ because I'm putting him at number two. You'll see who goes ahead of him and we'll see if you agree with me. First appearing in the Dark Knight's Metal comic book event in 2019, the Red Death is basically what you get when you give Batman super speed, super strength, and durability. This means that this variant can use the extreme intellect of Batman and apply it at extreme speeds, crafting bat gadgets faster than the speed of light and tracking down his enemies effortlessly in a split second. The way this villain is formed is that Batman is jaded by his experiences of loss, getting emotionally exhausted by losing so many sidekicks and deciding that he needs to take matters into his own hands. This dark motivation also adds to the Red Death's power as he takes out his anger on the world with extreme speed and extreme power. At number one is Zoom. I'm putting Zoom at number one. Zoom is a double variant of Flash, which is my way of saying that he's a variant of Reverse Flash, who is himself already a variant, so he's a double variant. But this version of Reverse Flash is even more powerful than the original, having an even more refined control over his time travel abilities. In the case of Zoom, he can speed up and slow down time around him without his frame of reference being affected. This means he can avoid the typical complications that other speedsters face like intense friction and seeing and hearing at these intense speeds. Zoom's grim backstory also empowers his motivations having lost both his parents at a young age to his father's violence as a notorious serial killer. Zoom goes right up to number one on the list because his grasp on his speed abilities is so impressive that he transcends into a new realm of power and becomes an adept time traveler as a result. At number 10 we have Throg. This guy deserves a spot on the list mainly for the meme, but also because it's one of the iterations of Thor that doesn't take itself too seriously. For those who don't already know, this is obviously a trick played by Loki to humiliate his brother Thor. In Thor number 365, Throg makes his first appearance when Loki decides he wants to get a laugh out of his otherwise very serious and stoic brother. But this isn't the last time we see him. In an issue of What If that plays out if the X-Men stayed on Asgard, a Thorified version of Storm faces off against Throg for the glory of Asgard. 
which is pretty bonkers. I mean, you know how what ifs can be, right? It's definitely a bizarre moment that's probably meant for a laugh more than anything else. But believe it or not, this still isn't the last time Throg makes an appearance. We see him yet again in Lockjaw and the Pet Avengers number one in 2009 alongside other animal versions of the Avengers. I guess readers just couldn't get enough of the little guy. He must have been rated pretty well because he, he just keeps coming back. He's funny looking. At number 9 we have Ultimate Thor. Being a pretty controversial set of comics, the Ultimate series sets the stage for some fun new characters as uncanny and overly dark as they can sometimes be. But Thor's variant in the series is anything but a miss. Originally dismissed by his teammates on the Ultimates as being crazy, this version of Thor unusually feels the need to prove himself to them in order to gain their trust and respect as the God of Thunder. He's got almost the same powers as the Earth 616 Thor, but he's rocking a different look that's pretty cool and also a magical belt that he wears which seems to give him a boost of power. He also holds an axe instead of a hammer which I just think is a pretty cool touch to have him stand out from his 616 counterpart. At number 8 we've got Thor 2099 where this world's Thor is actually a priest named Cecil McAdams who is part of a religion devoted solely to the original Thor who had lived a hundred years before by this point. What's bizarre about this character is that he doesn't actually come by Thor's powers naturally. His abilities are granted to him by the CEO of the Alchemax Corporation who has convinced him that he's a Norse god. It's actually a pretty dark reality playing out during the series with most of the world being run by corporations and greedy multimillionaires. And on top of all that, genuine superheroes are pretty scarce during these times unless they're created synthetically like McAdams is. Although it sounds like I'm basically just outing this guy as a fraud, he still means entirely well and he's passionate about Norse mythology. What I find really cool about this character is that he's become a superhero through passion and obsession with the real Thor, which sort of turns him into a pretty genuinely powerful and motivated variant, especially since he fully believes he's the real deal. Number 7. Spider-Man Reign. 35 years have passed. Spider-Man is an old retired man. Mary Jane Watson has passed away. New York is under the control of dictator Mayor Waters and his police force called Rain. But unbeknownst to most, it was Venom who had been pulling the strings, taking the position of aide to the mayor in the body of Edward Sachs. This version of Venom is much more brooding, maniacal, and downright dastardly than his mainline counterpart, plotting, scheming for the eventual return of his rival. He's a bitter old symbiote since Spider-Man retired, feeling abandoned by the hero and cannot wait to get his hands back on him. He has replicated himself thousands of times, put together the Sinister Six, and has trapped the citizens of New York in the city with his security system known as Web. That's W-E-B-B. -B. All that and he is still defeated by the end of the comic. Shame. Number 6. Agent Venom. Flash Thompson. The bully to Peter Parker and unknowingly his high school number one fan. After he goes off to the army and loses both of his legs, he joins up with a secret government program, Project Rebirth 2.0, that sees him bond with the Venom symbiote to become Agent Venom, a symbiote super soldier who set off on his own as a hero. Joining the Secret Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Thunderbolts, and fighting in lots and lots of stories before he lost the symbiote and eventually became Agent Anti-Venom. With the symbiote, Flash gets the superhero starter pack of powers, plus those awarded to hosts of symbiotes. So that's wall crawling, web generation, spider sense, plus invulnerability to spider sense, invisibility, symbiote tendrils, and shape shifting, and hive mind, and all that extra good stuff. But being a soldier, he is also extremely adept with weapons. He's an awesome fan favorite character just like the original Venom, giving him a whole ton of the power of popularity. Number 5. Earth X. If you haven't read Earth X, well, do it. But the basic premise is that in this alternate reality, the people of the Earth all begin to gain mutant abilities. And in the words of Syndrome from The Incredibles, and when everyone's super, no one will be. Captain America specifically was a bit more tragic in this story. For starters, he felt unworthy as he had actually separated the Red Skull from his head using his shield in an act of vengeance, causing him to step down from the Avengers out of shame. But this likely led to all the Avengers except Vision being defeated by Absorbing Man. So this Cap was a faded version of what he could have been, but he still had all the same powers and abilities and still fought against what was wrong and stood for what was right. But it's when he passed on that he actually became more powerful. Cap turned into one of Marvel's avenging hosts, which were basically 
angels in the realm of the dead. His wings enabled him to fly. He could change his shape, but usually looked like himself. He was able to travel between the dimensions of the land of the dead to paradise and from paradise to the antimatter sun of the negative zone. On top of that, Cap could also awaken the latent memories of those in the realm of the dead with a single touch. He also wielded an extremely cool sword, but we don't know what its capabilities really are because he never used it. He is a much different Captain America with an extremely unique set of powers and abilities, but he's also one of the coolest. Number 4. Kiyoshi Morales When a group of five Captain Americas from different realities are brought together, we get a look at two who have not been seen before. But the one I want to talk about here is Kiyoshi Morales, the great grandnephew of Luke Cage, and he is the 25th century's Commander A. Kiyoshi is a much more physically imposing character, standing at what looks like almost 7 feet tall, and he was definitely the biggest among the Captain Americas gathered by Toth Key in Captain America Corps No. 1 from 2011. Instead of a vibranium shield, Kiyoshi's suit can generate energy shields on each arm, which resemble the normal Captain America vibranium shield. His suit is much more advanced as well, as you'd expect from the 25th century Captain America stand-in. For example, it features a neuro web, which allows him to tap into the wireless systems and stored information of the world. He had all the enhancements we'd expect, and he is just a super cool character who I really hope we get to see in the future. But for now, he is definitely my favorite of the members of the Captain America Corps. Number 3. Ultimate Universe In the Ultimate Universe, it seems that Captain America's treatment with the Super Soldier Serum actually seem to give him a bit more of an edge in terms of his powers. For example, while this universe's Hulk is a bit weaker than the 616 version, he is still incredibly strong. But this Captain America was able to go toe to toe for a few rounds against the Hulk, almost actually defeating him and eventually knocking him out. Which is like, 616 Cap could never do that. Ultimate Cap also seemed pretty capable of handling armies of guys all on his own. He was an extremely capable leader while also being a bit more than a little ruthless compared to his 616 counterpart. Like when he was fighting against the Chitauri Hair Kleiser, his rival. He resorted to traumatizing Bruce Banner to get him to turn into the Hulk and then convincing him that Kleiser was getting it on with Betty Ross so that Hulk would pummel Kleiser into the concrete and then eat him. That kind of wholesome stuff. Nice. Number 2. Soldier Supreme A cap wielding Mjolnir? Cool. But how about a cap with the mystical and magical powers of the Sorcerer Supreme? Well, we get that in Infinity Warps, when Gamora, wielding the Infinity Gauntlet, basically folds reality in half, merging characters with other characters. One of the two merged together, in case you didn't catch on, is Captain America Steve Rogers and the Sorcerer Supreme Doctor Stephen Strange. The result would be Stephen, with a PH, Rogers. The Soldier Supreme. He fought in World War II against the German Hell Priest Dormammu Red, and would use his super enhancements in military training alongside his mystical and magical abilities. During World War II, he teamed up with his howling commandos of Hogoth, including Dum Dum Fury and Bucky Wong. Later, in the modern era, after returning from banishment in the Negative Zone, he would team up with Iron Hammer, Arachnite, and Weapon Hex to battle against Devondra. Number 1. Super Soldier Seems like when you take one character and smush them together with another character, you get a pretty OP new character. Like Soldier Supreme, or Cap wielding Mjolnir, or even Danielle Cage to a degree. But what if you took Captain America and you fused him together with one of the strongest characters in all of comic books. Well, in the Amalgam Universe where Marvel characters are mixed in with DC Comics characters, we got Super Soldier. And if you haven't guessed by now, this is Captain America mixed together with Superman. When Clark Kent volunteered for the Super Soldier program, he was injected with a Super Soldier serum containing cellular kryptonite samples from an alien while also being doused in solar radiation. The result was a power set unheard of for any other Captain America. Super strength over 1 million tons. Invulnerability to everything but Green K, as it's called. Superhuman stamina to the point of being completely tireless. He can fly at speeds of around Mach 10. He has superhuman speed at speeds of about 2,000 miles per second. He can hear and smell anything on Earth. He has a sonic scream that allows Clark to destroy someone's literal essence. No need to eat or sleep. He can heal instantly from most any injury due to his altered metabolism. 
Clark can create hurricane level winds by blowing and can also kill his breath to project ice from his mouth. And he has extremely hot heat vision. I think, um, I think yeah, that, that pretty much covers it and I don't really need to say more. But you take all that and put it in the mind of an expert tactician and soldier, it's game over for you, buddy. Sorry. Number 10, Peter Parker of Earth 92100. You'd think the addition of extra arms for a Spider-Man would be an added benefit. When it happened to Peter in the 616 universe, he panicked and got rid of it with the DNA of Morbius. Understandably, but on Earth 92100, Morbius did not live long enough to help Peter, being eaten by sharks of all things. And since no one else could, Peter kinda had to just deal with it. Turns out, during a fight with Doc Ock, after Peter embraced his extra appendages, they actually give him a distinct advantage. They actually grant him much more strength and agility, and using them, he is even able to save Gwen Stacy from her demise. Unfortunately, they don't really protect him from the inheritor. Spider Limbs here sacrifices himself to save Spider-Man 2099 and Lady Spider in Spider-Man 2099 Volume 2 Number 6 in 2014. Number 9, Spider Assassin. Do you know how effective Spider-Man would actually be if he was a little less moral but still a crime fighter? Pretty effective. And while we've seen a few different examples of this, I chose to pull from What If, Spider-Man vs Wolverine number 1, where we are introduced to Spider Assassin. In his universe, with great power comes great responsibility and greater enemies, which led this Peter of Earth 8351 to leave New York to protect his family. He joined up with Wolverine and likely because of this friendship, he is much, much much less opposed to sending criminals to the afterlife. He's also almost always serious, not resorting to quips and jokes to cope with situations anymore, which is reflective in his costume, which is a much darker look, especially with those black eyes. I really dig it. His web shooters have also been shown to shoot black webs in some panels, and they also include firearms. He is an effective addition to the Spider Army when it was formed, and an extremely effective Spider-Man indeed. Number eight, Spider's Man. All right, yeah. Nope, not a fan of this one. You ever seen those videos of people finding spider nests where it's literally a swarm of spiders? Yeah, okay, imagine that, but they're super powered and come together to take on a human form. Now you've got the terrifying Spider's Man, which, side note, that's a great name. <laughs> In spider get in number 3 of 2018, we are introduced to a colony of radioactively powered spiders who consumed a high school boy by the name of Peter Parker when he fell into their enclosure at Horizon Labs. After consuming Peter, the spiders gained a sort of hive mind in Peter's image and began fighting crime in cruel York of Earth 11580. Other than his usual Spider-Man powers and the benefits of being a swarm of spiders, the colony is also able to poison its victims with a bite or, if they're hungry for power, devour them whole. And it's incredibly hard to actually de-life this guy, as even a single spider being alive means technically Spider's Man is also still alive and can multiply to rebuild itself. Number 7, MCU Captain America. I find it hard to be able to put most of the MCU iterations of characters into a list of most powerful versions of themselves. The MCU tends to depower a lot of their characters, which I suppose is understandable from like a storytelling perspective. But when this version of Cap wields Mjolnir and smacks around Thanos for a little while, nearly beating him all on his own, a feat the Hulk could not even achieve, and then fights the army Thanos brought with him, all with minimal training wielding the power of Thor. It's honestly a sight to behold. I almost wish they showed us Cap going through time, fixing all the branch timelines the Avengers had created. It would have been so cool seeing the ways he could use the hammer. Like, imagine Captain America flying through the air with his shield in one hand and being dragged by Mjolnir in the other. It would just be really cool. Number six. Danielle Cage. On Earth 15061, Danielle Cage, the daughter of both Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, would eventually become the Captain America of her time. And, well, let's just think about this for a second. The subsonic flight and superhuman longevity of her mother with the bulletproof skin of her father, plus the superhuman strength, durability, stamina, speed, and healing factor of both of them. Yes, Danielle Cage doesn't just use the shield of Captain America. 
She is the shield. She arguably does not even need her shield, which is a controllable drone replica of the original. Unfortunately, we don't get to see much of this version of Danielle Cage, but we know Danielle is a force to be reckoned with, and as such, she is a Captain America who deserves to be on this list. Number five, Venom 2099. The Earth of Spider-Man 2099 it's pretty awesome. Cyberpunk themes, President Doom, a seriously flawed Miguel O'Hara as Spider-Man with that awesome suit. It shouldn't be any surprise that the Venom of 2099 is just as awesome and pretty terrifying. The Venom symbiote in this world has been around for a long time. Like long enough even to have evolved to have new abilities. Really cool stuff like acid blood and spit. This version of the symbiote bonded itself to Kron Stone, the son of Tyler Stone and the elder half brother of Miguel O'Hara. Kind of confusing. The symbiote first appears when it tries to de life Tyler in the hospital, and that is when Spider Man intervenes. The fight goes on for a long time, like, like several issues long, with Venom making Spider Man choose between his two loves and even de lifing Spider Man's former lover, Dana. After Miguel learned of Venom's weakness to sound, sonic sounds were emitted all over the city, stunning Venom and allowing Spider Man to beat him. Later, the symbiote would emerge with Roman the Submariner and flee into the ocean. But but this version of the black goop really had some power, not to mention some anger issues. He was a true antithesis to Spider Man, as Venom should be. Number four, Host Rider. Ooh, wordplay. Well done. And also an extremely cool looking character with a Venom twist. Only it starts to make a little less sense the more you think about it. This Ghost Rider is actually Robbie Reyes, who if you don't know isn't actually the spirit of vengeance. He's actually the spirit of his uncle who seems to have completely taken over his body. And somewhere along the line, we're not told when, the Venom symbiote bonded with them creating this almost perfect chaotic parasitic being, basically just using the body of Robbie Reyes. Now like I said, it kind of makes no sense. Ghost Rider is literally hellfire and symbiotes are weak to fire, but I don't think anyone is really complaining. This guy is brutal. He dispatches shield agents with ease and he feeds the Calvin Zabo of his universe to his car. His car eats people! Come on! It is cool and terrifying all at the same time. This host rider has an ability called the Penance Kiss, which is very much like the Penance Stare, only with the mouth, determining people's guilt or innocence and then pretty much consuming their soul. I can't help but imagine what his voice sounds like. It's probably really cool. He's brutal, he's ruthless, he looks amazing, he's covered in fire, and they are host rider. Number three, May Parker Venom, Earth X. Earth 999, a world where basically every single person has powers, except things have gone apocalyptic, and where the daughter of Peter Parker, May Parker, is Venom. While her retired and cynical pops ain't too thrilled about it, she does actually have complete control over the symbiote thanks to her advanced and honed spider sense. She was eventually under the control of this kid, going by the Red Skull name, and thanks to her father and other Earth X classic heroes, was saved. With Venom and her father Spider Man going on to join the super powered police force and fight crime and super villain threats together. She eventually, after the death of of, well, death, was recruited by Kang the Conqueror as a multiversal team to fight the Apocalypse Twins. In addition to her proportional spider powers, plus the enhanced spider sense, she gains all the usual symbiote powers, plus a few extra, like what seems to be a rudimentary form of telepathy. And tis believed her symbiote could go on to mutate further to gain more powers, which is a good way for Marvel to say, we can do whatever we want with this. She is definitely one of the cooler incarnations of Venom, as are most characters on the Earth X world. Not a Venom, of their own perspective characters. You know what I meant. Number two, Barbarian Venom. Okay, he's not a barbarian really. But in the War of the Realms, Eddie no longer has the symbiote Venom. He fights as best as he can against the Dark Elves on his own. A war witch sees his awesomeness and bestows a dream stone to him that will give him anything he wants. Now using this dream stone, he is imbued with all the powers of the Venom symbiote, but just quite a bit stronger and with Eddie's complete control. But on his rage, which he shows us when he completely cuts off the arm of the really powerful war witch and takes on a full force of giants and ogres and trolls and dark elves and a whole bunch of other stuff. But then he faces off against Jack O'Lantern, also boosted up by another dreamstone. While this fire based villain would be a problem for Venom, Eddie gets this stone looking armor stuff. And this is where we get the Viking barbarian looking Venom. Because he literally looks like a barbarian with a crazy horned helmet with a 
big axe with all these runes and he's just so badass. He completely unlocks the seemingly unlimited amount of power from this dream stone. Just go into town and he even bonds the symbiote to civilians who join in the fight against the dark elves. Eddie literally calls down lightning on Jack O' Lantern. He's wild. And eventually this dream stone symbiote thing corrupts him a little bit and he gives it up but damn I love this story. Check it out. Number one, Gwenum. Ooh, more wordplay. Even nicer. But she hasn't just got wordplay on her side. No, Spider Gwen of Earth 65, or Ghost Spider, which is way better, has easily one of the best costumes of all the spider heroes. Throw in a healthy dash of a symbiotic monster from outer space, notorious for giving great fashion advice, and, well, look at her. She's absolutely amazing. On top of that, Gwen sort of relies on Venom for her powers since her original powers started to fade. But while that sounds bad, Gwen has actually learned to find a very healthy balance with her symbiote. The symbiote itself enhances whatever emotions the host has, right? So when she first bonded with Venom, thanks to a corrupt Matt Murdock kingpin who she was forced to team up with, she was rage fueled and looking for revenge against the rhino for attacking her father and eventually against Murdock himself. But over time, she realized that she needed to control that and give Venom better qualities to enhance in order to control and find balance with the symbiote. In a way, Venom actually helped her to become a better hero, all while still retaining that really, really sweet suit. Mwah. Chef's kiss, Gabella. Mwah. Number 10, Red Sun Superman. Instead of landing in America, Red Sun Superman landed in the Soviet Union, and that allowed the Soviets to weaponize him instead of allowing Clark Kent to live the normal life he traditionally has. He received severe training that not even the original Superman underwent, as Red Sun Superman was always meant to become a weapon. This allowed him to become quite strong as he paired his severe training with his new communist sense of duty. Duty. If the training he underwent wasn't enough to prove his power though, Superman advanced the Soviet Union to almost worldwide control without resorting to war and he virtually eliminated poverty and disease. This powerful version of Superman is a much more skilled Superman as that's what he was raised to be. But it was his ability to eventually realize the fault in his own actions and allow the world to become a utopia that kind of puts him a cut above. I don't want to give much of this story away, but if you haven't read it, man, the end it'll just kind of knock your socks off. You should definitely read it. Number nine, Ultraman. Who would have thought that a Superman who is just a giant man baby would be one of the more powerful versions of the character? Anyone who has read the Crime Syndicate or Forever Evil stories would probably know this. Ultraman is the Superman of Earth 3, where strength and power are held above everything else. Because of this, the moral ideals that normally hold back Superman are completely gone for Ultraman. Like all evil Superman, he does not hold back at all. But unlike most other Supermen, Ultraman's relationship with Kryptonite is quite different. Instead of weakening the Kryptonian, Kryptonite gives him a crazy significant boost to his power when he crushes it up and inhales it. It's actually kind of terrifying to be completely honest. Fortunately though, for the heroes of the world, he is depowered by the sun, which caused him to move the moon to block it out when he and the crime syndicate of America invaded the prime DC continuity. Number eight, Calvin Ellis. Instead of Cal L landing on a farm in Kansas, a black Kryptonian named Calvin Ellis was sent to Earth to escape his planet's destruction. Nevertheless, he didn't grow up trying to fit into society as he instead became very ambitious. What do I mean? Well, Calvin Ellis worked hard enough to eventually become the President of the United States, giving him a position that allowed him to better protect his world both politically and physically. He still carried his role of Superman and even became a multiversal hero when he teamed up with the other versions versions of the character during the Infinite Frontier era. Kind of like Red Sun Superman, Calvin Ellis gained political power as well as his own incredible abilities, not to mention that he reprogrammed the alien intelligence Brainiac to help him in his duties. He's also a talented boxer, so there's that. Number seven, which marked Wonder Woman. Years ago, a 12 year old Diana Prince came upon a ritual being performed at a crossroads in Themyscira to the goddess of magic and witches, Hecate, by her followers. Diana gets grabbed 
by the followers and Hecate brands her with a witch mark and she vowed to Hippolyta that one day she would return to use her witch mark to take over the world. Once things start popping off in the 2018 witching hour crossover, Earth's magic is beginning to disappear and Hecate is obviously to blame. Hecate activates her witch mark, five women who have been branded including Diana. The witch mark power Diana possesses could rip the world apart and tear holes in reality. It's honestly very insane and it only gets crazier as she gains the power of the other witch mark. Now I glossed over quite a bit for the sake of time so I suggest you read the story. Number 6 Dawnbreaker. Now this is like a mix of evil Green Lantern and evil Bruce Wayne. Technically it's just Bruce Wayne but after the passing of his parents that fateful night the young Bruce Wayne comes into possession of a Green Lantern ring. We have seen Bruce Wayne wield a Green Lantern ring before but this is the dark multiverse. Bruce has an unbelievably strong will and using his powerful will he is able to override the programming of the lantern ring allowing him to use it to take lives. He creates monstrously terrifying green light constructs and uses them to not just ruthlessly battle criminals but anyone who stands in his way including James Gordon, other green lanterns and the guardians of the universe. Number 5 Robin on regular earth 2. Now this earth 2 is the one where all the golden age heroes of DC comics are situated. In the golden age timeline his history is the same as the original because technically he is the original. Right? Where things change is what would have been when he reached adulthood. In the diverging timeline of Earth 2, Dick Grayson actually remains the only Robin for his whole career. He grows up keeping the title and actually goes to school to become a lawyer. He takes up the Batman mantle once and comes into conflict with the Joker, but that makes him retire from the Batman name and he continues on performing as the senior partner of the new dynamic duo which consisted of himself as Robin and Bruce Wayne's daughter Helena as Huntress. And the two took part in the battle of the crisis on infinite earths where they unfortunately passed away. Number 4 Nightwing from the new order. In the year 2028 all out war between heroes and villains had broke out in the streets of metropolis. There was countless deaths and destruction caused by the conflict for days but after batman passed away in the conflict Nightwing activated a device in the war torn streets of metropolis that shut off or dampened the superpowers of most of the world believing it was the best cause of action to save humanity from the dangers of superpowered population. Now after this Dick began a relationship with Starfire from the Teen Titans and together they had a son named Jake. As time went on Starfire progressively fell out of love with Dick and resented his cause. One day after Dick had chosen to lead the new Crusaders division to hunt metahumans, Starfire left Dick without saying a word, forcing him to raise their son alone in Wayne Manor. It turns out Jake is actually a metahuman with superpowers and Nightwing now has to go against everything he previously stood for to save his son from the world that he actually created. Number 3 Injustice Cyborg In this timeline, just like most of the other heroes, Cyborg had a very similar life to his main Earth counterpart. That is, up until Superman went bonkers. Once Superman established his regime, Cyborg kind of became Superman's boy scout. He was very dedicated to Superman, which is not what I would have expected honestly. He was Superman's guy in the chair and helped him out quite a bit. Honestly, Cyborg was kind of really lame in this story. He gets defeated and incapacitated a lot. The best one though was when Batman revealed there had been a virus that he implanted in Cyborg when they first met and just had it in his back pocket for whenever he would need it. Number 2 Murder Machine Yes, there is a Batman Cyborg hybrid who is part of the Batman Who Laughs Dark Knights and yes, he is terrifyingly awesome. Murder Machine first appears in Dark Days the casting in the Dark Multiverse Earth negative 44. On this world, this evil Batman cyborg comes about after the passing of Alfred Pennyworth in the Batcave by a group of Batman's villains. As Bruce Wayne's father figure and closest friend, Bruce took this loss hard and he blamed himself. He asked Cyborg to make an Alfred Cyborg AI called Alfred Protocol in order to help Bruce like Alfred used to do when he was alive. Unfortunately, like most AI in fiction, it went mad with its directive of protecting Batman. It spread like a virus, took down all the villains, then all the heroes, and even took over Batman's body since it didn't believe that Batman could protect himself well enough. And Batman just didn't want to be separated from Alfred so he was kind of cool with it too. And in at number 1 is Grid. 
As with a lot of these alternate Justice League variants, we gotta turn to Earth 3 for at least one. After the cyborg of Earth 3 gained his abilities, he realized that he could monitor all superhuman beings, but he didn't want to invade their privacy directly. So instead, he let secondary subsystems within his software do the privacy invading itself. He called this the grid. Unfortunately though, this grid managed to grow and learn from hackers and viruses throughout the world so that it grew into a neural network that then developed into full consciousness with some help from Atomica who used it against the Justice League and brought it with her to the crime syndicate of America. Grid now used Cyborg's parts and body to give itself its own body. Essentially it took over the body of Cyborg gaining all of his powers but with none of his humanity. It's very 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 scary. Number 10 Deceased After the Justice League defeated Darkseid he somehow managed to discreetly abduct Cyborg and take him to his homeworld of Apocalypse. There it was revealed that a half of the anti-life equation was contained inside Cyborg. Darkseid sought to merge the half of the equation inside Cyborg with the half he already possessed but Desaad warned that combining the two halves inside Cyborg would likely kill him. But Darkseid don't cur so he tried to do it anyways which resulted in a corrupted anti-life equation that became a techno organic virus and infected Darkseid. Darkseid upset shot this infected Cyborg back to Earth where he automatically connected to the world wide web instantly infecting every single person who was using it with the virus and chaos immediately erupted. While he kind of unintentionally put a zombie like plague on the world he did try to save it in the end. Keyword try. Number 9 Aquaborg In Superman Batman issues 60 and 61 we're introduced to the Justice Titans and in case it wasn't obvious this is indeed a mashed together version of both the Justice League and the Teen Titans which in my mind makes things kind of complicated since Cyborg is a main part of both after Flashpoint. Aquaborg himself seems to be a mix of Aquaman and Cyborg as his name is Arthur Stone. We don't really see him do anything specifically worth mentioning other than fighting Batman and an amalgamated Doomsday and Deathstroke called Doomstroke. Number 8 Earth 3839 In this alternate universe appearing in Superman and Batman Generations 2 number 4 Cyborg mm, well he's a bit of a chump. During a confrontation with Metallo this Earth's Alexander Luther Cyborg gets completely immobilized by an EMP and had to be carried to safety by the other heroes who included J West the Flash Clark Wayne, a superpowered Nightwing, Janet Hall as Black Hawk, and Hal Jordan Green Lantern. Unfortunately, there isn't really much more to say about this one. He was he was kind of poo, but at least the story was cool. Number seven, Red Robin from Kingdom Come. In the Kingdom Come story, Superman and the other Justice League members are forced out of retirement to combat a new dangerous generation of heroes. This future version of Richard Grayson actually became the first ever Red Robin in his middle age, but not as a sidekick to Batman. Instead, he was part of Superman's Justice League. He played a similar role to Batman as part of this league being like a stealthy hand to hand combatant. This version of Grayson also has a daughter with Starfire from the Teen Titans named Mari Grayson who goes by the hero name Nightstar. Kingdom Come is considered one of the best graphic novels of all time and I'm glad Richard is a part of it especially since it brought us the awesome Red Robin costume. Number 6 Cute Batman I'm sorry I call them Cute Batman but honestly Look at him, he's kind of adorable. On Earth 42, all the superheroes appear to be these little kid like versions of their normal counterparts. Here, Dick Grayson has gone on to take up the Batman mantle after this world's Bruce Wayne was killed by a villain from an alternate reality called Super Doom. Now, Dick acquired the Multiversity Guidebook, which detailed DC's current 52 universes, and using it, he teamed up with various Batman and helped to bring the heroes of the multiverse together. All the little heroes of this world eventually discovered they were actually androids under the control of the empty hand in order to spy on the house of heroes. Still adorable though. Just saying. Number 5 All Star Superman All Star Superman is actually a 12 issue series that sets itself apart from the rest of the DC universe by sort of being a standalone story. At the beginning of the tale Superman saves an exploration mission to the sun that was sabotaged by Lex Luthor. But because of his overexposure to the yellow sun he ends up developing new abilities such as the power to harness his bioelectric aura and pushing his normal abilities to 
unimaginable levels. But it wasn't just his powers that got a boost. His intellect, creativity, imagination, and curiosity also got boosted up to the point that he started getting new skills and trying out new experiments. Even some that would allow a successor for himself to be created. That's important because while his abilities and mental acuity had been boosted up and he even became immune to green kryptonite, the overexposure to the sun also meant that he was starting to slowly pass away as his cells became overloaded, causing this story to get really damn emotional. Number 4 Strange Visitor Superman Ok, before we start, technically this Superman is not canon, but he is truly one of the more powerful versions of the character. In his story, Superman outlives everything in the universe, living for literally billions and billions of years. He lives so long and gets so powerful that he gains new abilities like being able to split himself into thousands of copies that allow the hero to do what he does best throughout the universe. He outlives all the gods, cosmic entities, mortals, angels, demons, and everything. He watches countless civilizations rise and fall and learns an insane amount of skills like telepathy. He absorbs ridiculous amounts of energy, learns magic and strange sciences through all his copies and then reabsorbs them at the end of everything. He can fly faster than the entropic waves of the end of the universe and can even manipulate the fabric of reality through sheer strength. Number 3 Quantum Superman Alan Adam is Captain Adam or the Quantic Superman of Earth 4. He is basically a fusion of Dr. Manhattan and Superman. Mm, sort of. Adam obtained his powers when he was present at an experimental uranium engine that was being tested, which then exploded, turning him into a disembodied mind with no natural division in his perception of time, meaning he perceives the past and the future as a single entity. He has some insane abilities. He has the ability to change his own size, levitate, and telekinetically restructure matter which he used to construct himself a new physical body after his original body was destroyed. Using quantum super position, he is able to generate copies of himself. He is able to perceive and manipulate reality on at least an 8th dimensional level and also possesses quantum sense making him capable of knowing potentially everything. He is also responsible for merging the minds of both Superman and Ultraman in order to operate the next spot on this list. Number 2 Cosmic Armor Superman Cosmic Armor Superman is basically a thought robot that eventually became one of the strongest versions of Superman. Even though it might be one of the weirdest ones of all time and depending on your viewpoint you may not count him as a version of Superman at all. I respect that viewpoint but he always comes up when people talk about the strongest versions of Superman so here he is. This creature is somewhat strange in the sense that it isn't quite human but it isn't quite artificial as well. The thought robot was created so that Superman and the antimatter universe Ultraman together could battle something stronger than they could ever normally face on their own. After the battle was done, the thought robot eventually merged with the entire universe's consciousness. But let me just list the powers that he has here. His powers include reactive evolution, quantum manipulation, plot manipulation, energy manipulation, reality warping, space and time manipulation, immortality, matter manipulation, fourth wall awareness, and a bunch of powers that we can't even imagine. And number 1 Superman Prime Superman Prime or Superman 1 million debuted during the DC 1 million event. This version of Superman stuck around earth till the end of the 21st century but after all of those he grew to love passed away he handed off the Superman mantle to his successor and then went off into space from the 22nd century all the way to the 700th century. He gained godlike abilities and could even bestow his power on others which he did when he returned to earth and his descendants. But this guy also spent 15,000 years inside the sun and was drenched in its yellow radiation to become an even stronger version than he already was. He essentially became a god in his own right due to the fact that his exposure to the sun for thousands of years allowed him to increase his powers exponentially. Superman Prime became faster and stronger than any of his other versions and his powers were increased to unthinkable levels. Number 10 Multiple Man Venom In the Old Man Logan story we get a very awesome if not short lived look at the Tyrannosaurus Rex that was host to the Venom symbiote. Now while that is an awesome idea, 
we learn nothing further about this Venom variant until Old Man Hawkeye, the prequel. In this story, we see a Venom who bonds to the Madrox gang, who have kind of separated from James Madrox. After Venom bonded to the Madrox, they now use their power to duplicate themselves into an army of Venoms, vowing to track down Hawkeye, who had stuck the other Madrox members with plenty of arrows. An army of Venoms chasing you across the country would be terrifying. Luckily, with the help of his friends, Hawkeye is able to trick the symbiote into reducing its number to chase him into the forest, where he bonds with said T-Rex. And now we've come full circle. Number 9. Venom Pool I'm not talking about the what if Jerry Curl Venom Deadpool, although he's awesome. And I'm not talking about the back in black Deadpool, no. We're talking about the Edge of Venomverse one shot. In this world, there is a sentient tapeworm discovered by scientists that is being turned into a weapon by said scientists. Scientists, man. They never learn. Deadpool stumbles upon a lab where these tapeworms have taken over the bodies of the scientists here and they begin to attack Deadpool. Now, lucky for him, there's just a venom symbiote in a jar and he breaks and bonds with it and uses it to absolutely annihilate the tapeworms. He honestly ends up looking really cool, much more armored and alien looking than he did before, which I think there are a lot of allusions to the movie Alien in this comic, but I digress. Venom Pool basically goes around battling these tapeworms, helping delivering mothers and making balloon tapeworm animals for their kids. And he's killing it until he's snatched away by Captain America Venom, taking him to join the Venomverse team. Number eight. Kingpin Venom. In the alternate Earth TRN 421, we pick up in the year 2061, and Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin, has ended the mortal existence of Eddie Brock and taken the Venom symbiote as his own, bonding into this monstrous, massive, fat guy Venom, which is really, really intimidating already. But what we learn is that Kingpin has modified the symbiote to be able to travel through technology, kind of like how the ultimate version of Iron Man can, but way quicker, way cooler, and way more terrifying. King Venom Pin, as I'm gonna call him, can basically travel through electricity and the internet. He is seen controlling cars, helicopters, and even electronic billboards, all to pursue Peter Parker's Spider-Man, who has to literally run away because he cannot take on this guy. In the end, Peter had to flee into the woods where King Venom followed. This part of the fight didn't last very long though, with Peter using the fire from a torch to detach the symbiote from Kingpin, saving the day rather annoyingly. This guy is definitely way too cool to be defeated, but you know, whatever. At number seven is Thor, Herald of Galactus. This one doesn't need much explanation for those who already know the role of the Herald of Galactus, but basically, Galactus is this enormous cosmic being that has an insatiable hunger for planets, so he goes around consuming them with absolutely zero remorse. But even a being as gigantic and powerful as Galactus needs some help to get his destructive work done. So he always has someone called a Herald that that helps guide him through the cosmos and find the next planets for him to consume. In exchange, the Heralds are granted ownership over the Power Cosmic, which basically gives them a fraction of Galactus's power, which even a fraction is a ton if you know Galactus. With the Power Cosmic, the Herald is then able to travel at immeasurable speeds through the cosmos and harness almost limitless power in order to fulfill their duties. And at one point, Thor is chosen as the next Herald. His costume changes to something much darker darker and even cooler in some ways, and also if you imagine Thor's powers paired with the effects of the aforementioned power cosmic, then you can also imagine why this variant deserved a spot on this list in terms of power as well. At number 6 is Iron Hammer. This is such a cool variant because he answers the question, what would happen if Thor and Iron Man combined their abilities into one hero? When Gamora manipulates the souls of the Marvel Universe and mixes them all together, she ends up creating a whole new world called Warp World. Sounds kind of fun, doesn't it? It sounds like the name of a crappy small town arcade. And we all know those are always the best ones. But it is far from that. It's actually a universe where every soul is combined with another within the Marvel Universe. This event basically creates a mixture of Thor and and Iron Man, aka Stark Odinson, son of Howard Odin. Riveting bit of writing right there. Basically, this variant ends up with a pretty cool new look as well as a brand new set of capabilities that basically combine Iron Man's wit and intelligence with Thor's supreme godlike power. I mean, even if this was just Iron Man wielding Mjolnir, it would be cool enough, but part of Thor is still in there somewhere, which makes it even more insane to imagine how powerful this variant could be. Number five. The Spider of Earth-15 There are a lot of characters who go by the spider, 
But specifically, I'm talking about the one that's bonded with the Carnage symbiote who comes from Earth 15. The spider of Earth 15 is a much more sadistic, sociopathic, redheaded version of Peter Parker, which is proven by the fact that he has been sentenced to a total of 67 life sentences in prison for the crimes he has committed. To make him just a bit more lovable, he has a sense of humor very much like that of Deadpool. The spider was introduced in Exiles number 12 and was a big part of the reality conquering Weapons X team featured in it, being a sometimes leader of that team. As a carnage bonded sociopath, he was pretty powerful, but he was nonetheless sent to the afterlife by a blast from Firestar in Exiles number 44. Number 4 Poison. From one symbiote to another. Every time that pesky Venom symbiote would try to merge with Peter Parker, he would only get halfway before Peter could repel him. Now, what happens if Peter Parker is defeated by Venom, who completely bonds with him? In the What If Spider Man The Other story, after Peter is defeated by Morlun and cocoons himself under Brooklyn Bridge, he is offered the chance to be resurrected by the Spider God. But instead of allowing this, he refuses and is ejected from his cocoon, non resurrected. Cut to Venom, who, being Spider Man's crazy ex girlfriend, senses what is happening and completely ditches his current host. He intercepts Peter's body and after after months of struggling, fully bonds to Peter. Now, Peter has all the fully realized powers that come with being a symbiote, but he actually has stingers that are capable of piercing the skin of Luke Cage, which is pretty insane. Number 3, Spider Hulk. The second spider amalgam here, Spider-Man of the Immortal Hulk with great power story is granted the alter ego of the Hulk after Loki magically transferred the gamma power to him. So it's Spider-Man's relative spider powers mixed with an unstoppable green monstrosity with the temperament of a toddler. It's actually really really cool. Eventually, the power of the Hulk is switched back to Banner with the help of the Fantastic Four and Banner's own genius. It's a short little story that seems almost self-contained, but it's an insanely cool one and a Spider Hulk would be an incredibly powerful character if he were to show up again and had more time to hone his abilities and temper tantrums. Number 2, Ghost Spider. The last Spider-Man mashup with other heroes. But nonetheless, possibly one of the most powerful potential mashups. Also, in my opinion, the coolest looking one. Also, also, it appears that Uncle Ben leaving this plane of existence is actually a really good thing. See, on Earth 11638, Ben never loses his life to a mugger and he helps train Peter with his powers and helping him form Parker Industries. Peter and Uncle Ben end up building a machine that allows Peter to lure alternate versions of Spider-Man to this reality where he absorbs their powers to increase his own. That kind of took a dark turn didn't it? But when he tried to do this to the apparently most powerful Spider-Man from Earth 616, he is de-lifed and his soul is sent to hell where with the assistance of the Infernal Hulk, he is fused with the spirit of vengeance, becoming the Ghost Spider. If you know anything about Ghost Rider, you know how actually insanely powerful he is, even going toe to toe with Galactus at one point. So yeah, this Spider-Man slash Ghost Rider guy is potentially extremely powerful. Number 1. Cosmic Spider-Man There was a point in time when Peter Parker of Earth 616 absorbed the Enigma Force and became the most powerful version of Spider-Man we have ever seen, even capable of punching the Hulk into orbit. In the mainline continuity, he doesn't have it for very long. But on Earth 13, he kept the powers and became the hero Captain Universe. So, this Peter Parker has all the usual Spider Man powers, but also now has cosmic awareness where he can sense things on a subatomic level and from crazy distances. He has energy manipulation, giving him energy blasts and flight. He also used his abilities to manipulate matter, making his webs as strong as adamantium, or even changing their shape altogether. His universe became a safe haven for all the Spider Men when the inheritors were hunting them because Captain Universe could defeat them, and his cosmic powers are gone when he leaves that dimension. Unfortunately, he is consumed by Solus, who used the life force basis of his powers against him in Amazing Spider Man number 11 in 2014. He's still cool though.